Okay. So we are here with Jeanette, who has been, how long have you been doing it, Tenyo? Poof, is it since just before the conference? What, so like two, two years, pretty much? Two years ago? I think so. Yeah. So, and, um, and I think you're doing, I think your progress with this is pretty incredible. I really do. And I would like you just to share a little bit with people about where you came from, where you were at with math, and maybe a little bit about your background. Okay. So I came from a pretty dark abyss when it comes to math. <laughs> I know. Okay, I'm going to say something before you before you tell everyone. I just want to interject here just a little bit before you start. Like, I think it's probably people that have struggled with math. I'm going to say that you are probably you're probably the worst one I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I love you, so you know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, so, so when you say pretty dark abyss, I'm going to agree with you. How about that? <laughs> yeah, you know, one of my biggest memories was sitting in senior school. And for us, that started at 11 and uh, till we were 16, is sitting with the same teacher for the first three years of that. And I sat at the front. I was keen with my hand up after he'd finished his explanation saying, what, <laughs> can you tell me that again? Because I don't understand. And then um, just, you know, getting that kind of, oh, put your hand down, just do it, you know. And, and so I could go through the motions with all the formulas and everything, but had no clue why or, you know, I was just plugging in numbers, which I mean, a monkey could probably do that you know it was at that level and so you know I it took me two attempts to get my basic high school maths and even then you know the, the exams are just set up that you again you're just plugging in numbers as long as you can recall the formula but there's absolutely no understanding whatsoever and you know and, and we're talking about even basic fractions and things and so when as an adult and you know all through kind of teenage years and everything if I was faced with somebody starting to tell me a math problem and spouting numbers at me or I'm faced with you know a, a numerically written equation or something in front of me or a page of numbers I couldn't even read it or listen. Immediately, there'd just be this black descending over me, you know, and I just absolutely freeze. And I can't even listen to the equation or read it because everything's just black and literally a panic, you know, and just like, I have no idea. I, I don't even know where to start. So, I, you know, and so just, uh, no confidence whatsoever either to even begin to look at it you, you, because you know you don't know where to start so you know in just this panic it was it was pretty horrible um but at the same time you know I know a lot of people who are very good at maths I know a lot I know some people who love maths and you know the, and I trained as a teacher. Can you believe that? Uh, <laughs> I did stick with early years. You'll be all very happy to hear. And then, um, you know, and I'm, I'm pretty solid with my foundational four, you know, processes, the basic processes and everything. But, um, you know, I, I really keep hearing more and more and reading more and more about you know, just this beautiful thing that maths is, this, you know, this wonderful thing and how it can enrich your life. And, you know, people are quite joyous about it. And it's like, that's what I want. That is what I want for me. I may not get there. And I'm, but saying that with Gatenio, I'm having those moments where I'm like, oh, wow, I don't really understand, but that is so cool, you know, because I, <laughs> 
relationships um, that I've never seen. Mm-hmm. And, um, but, you know, the, to, for the kids then, I want that kind of, I love maths. I love numbers, even if it's not something that they necessarily pursue in their career or whatever, but just to have that almost as, you know, just that kind of recurring background that one, they're competent and two, that they enjoy it too. You know, it it shouldn't be this panic inducing nightmare, you know, where you can't do anything to do with numbers. So yeah, it it was pretty horrific where I came (laughs) But I went to, you know, and I went to university and did a four-year B.Ed. Um, I think that's kind of common, so I'm not going to say yeah. anything. You know, yeah. you know, we've seen it personally, you know, when you've been at a training and you see teachers and you see how much they don't understand about the four basic operations and fractions. And, and that's something we should have had down in elementary school and we're not mm-hmm. doing it and we're not even getting teachers there and they're, you know, when they're learning to teach, we're still not getting the teachers there. I mean, you got a degree and you still, you know, you got the four basic operations down and, um, they're not so much fractions, but like not, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can understand like, well, you know, if I've got a pie or something and I've got to divide it into thirds or eights or, and I give someone two thirds, you know, yeah, that's fine. But beyond that, uh uh-uh, like absolutely not. So you're going to, so you've got this math background of panic, you know, so when you started homeschooling, so when did you guys start homeschooling? For my youngest, who's nine, he's never been to school. And Benjamin, just because of um, personal circumstances, he ended up going just for a year and a half when he was in first grade. So he went for first grade and the first portion of second grade, and he hated it. So, you know, the intention was to homeschool, but then my husband lost his job. So, you know, we couldn't initially. Uh So then pulled him out again and so we've been homeschooling properly since he was eight okay seven and a half something um so you have to teach math so how did you initially go about doing that asking everybody who I knew what do you use because you know you've got to you've got to get a plan together And everybody seemed to be using Matthew C or Saxon. And I looked at them and it was still a very traditional kind of format. And I thought, well, you know, if I don't understand this, how on earth can I help them when it's a repeat of what I had? Where, you know, there's a lot of memorization going on and... And, you know, if I do have to explain something, I can't. So I knew that that wasn't an option because there would be utter failures. And then I would feel the stress as well because I would know that I did not understand this thoroughly. You know, I've seen a Saxon math book and four. <laughs> you know, very <laughs> stuff. Um, I'm, I'm intimately familiar with the Saxon textbook, so yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. <laughs> And I wanted to, we did this class the other day and I said to everybody in the class, and I'll just repeat it here again, that you, if you think that you can get away with just doing um, an open book so that the book spoon feeds it to you, so you can spoon feed it back to your kids. Um, I have not yet met a child who asks the same questions that are addressed in the book. That doesn't like happen. Well, maybe, but I didn't give birth to those kids. So that didn't happen in my house. And I didn't know enough, especially as he got older, to answer the questions, to fill in where he didn't understand. So that book solved none of our problems. It created, all I could say is do this and get angry when you don't understand or get frustrated with you when you don't understand. It didn't solve our problem. Having scripted lessons didn't work at all. And getting a DVD didn't help, even if you replay it 52 times. If they don't understand that explanation, they don't understand that explanation. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you have a problem. And that, you know, just knowing myself, that stress that that would cause because, well, why are you looking at me to do this? It's on the page or it's on the video. You know, it, you have to know it because I don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and that would be way too stressful. So, you know, those very traditional kind of curriculums it, it couldn't be an option. And also I have a husband who's got a master's in math. So that's a lot of pressure because he doesn't understand how I could possibly have an issue with any of this because he's never had to study for maths a day in his life. He understands it and what's wrong with you kind of thing. So that's another pressure on me then as a homeschooling mom. And he doesn't take an active role in the teaching because he's not here. He has to work in the city. So, you know, there's that kind of underlying pressure there of these children still have to learn and be very competent with me because he kind of knows. <laughs> so, yeah. And so I looked at me Kwan as well. And it, that was kind of a possibility, but, you know, it still seemed like it was just a traditional curriculum but just rejigged a little bit so then I would still be in that same position of they're looking to me to teach things that I don't necessarily understand still and um, Crute and Ramon looked at that and I love some of the games and things some of it it, it, it was too overwhelming for me I felt like I needed to understand a lot more than I did to really benefit from what he was doing. Some of the standalone games are brilliant and I could take them and use them as is. Um, but yeah, I, I wasn't capable enough in my abilities to be able to kind of, you know, come up with this whole curriculum using his methodologies. I, you know, I, I, because I don't understand the connections for that bigger picture. You know, if if we're working on one concept, how it relates to something over here, it, you know, that might come up six months down the line, but to start drawing connections between things, I don't know because I don't understand that stuff yet that's six months down the line. So, I, I, you know, that's really hard when you don't have that full picture of where you're going and how everything is so interrelated. And, you know, it's just now that I'm you know, at that very basic level of trying to put this together. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, and then we're still in fractions. <laughs> and part of that is, you know, I, I think my elders could go further, but I'm not quite ready to take him further. So, yeah, I hold him back a little bit, I'm sure. But then I keep saying, well, he'll be good in the basics. <laughs> Because it's that, that it, and that's good too. You know, I don't think you can be too good in your uh -huh. foundational understanding of this. It's all the same thing. I mean, it really is. So if you, um, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. So when you sit down to teach, so, so you're, I mean, I'm somebody, so let's assume I'm coming to this and um, I don't know how to teach it. I'm, I'm in your shoes, the way where you were two years ago. So can you tell me how this looks for you to sit down with your kids and approach a lesson when you have no idea where it's going and you have no idea what you're going to discover and or even if you're going to understand or even if you're doing it right and getting over the how do I do this right? I've surrendered to... I have no idea what is going to happen, but that it's the playing and the noticing and the wondering that that is at the crux of it, not necessarily the activity and where is it going to go. It's just that actual process of doing it and, and like originally how it started in the beginning was your blog posts. You know, I would look and see what activities you've done. I would copy it. 
Just <laughs> like that. Because I didn't know where to start. Uh -huh. So whatever you did, that's what we did. <laughs> and I would wait eagerly for the next blog post, for the next activities. And, you know, that would be my next step too. And so we followed along like that for a long time. And only after doing the conferences and getting the textbooks, just having that confidence, you know, to do that a little bit more by myself or from Lacey's activities as well, you know, looking at her blog and she does little things. I just completely blatantly copy her activities too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you know, that's the beauty of it because there are these activities that you guys have like so clearly described how you sit down and start to talk about it. And so if I'm feeling a little bit lost, I can always come back to what were some of the things you noticed. And I even keep, the, I print out the blog posts in the beginning and I kept them next to me. So, you know, if I wasn't noticing things because I'm, you know, I was quite nervous, am I doing this right? And, and that, so I would have it there to kind of just prompt things, you know, and say, well, I noticed this. And then, because the kids weren't used to that either, you know, the noticing and wondering. So the more we did that, and then the children take over. And I still interject because then I'm genuinely starting to notice my things too. And so then it spirals all out of control. And some of the things we have just left because I don't know what to do with it. But I'm okay with that because I figure that just the doing of the activity and the noticing and the wondering, that's where the beauty lies. And we're talking about maths and we're seeing relationships. And then, it's, you know, that the more we do, the more interesting it is that we go, remember that? That's why we were doing that because this is it this is this is what we're doing <laughs> you know and, and we're starting to see some of those connections come now just because we've started building our own ideas you know around maths I think that's really important what you just said that you guys as a family are building your own ideas around maths yeah yeah. The things that you guys have discovered together and that this has been a joint family thing, not somebody sitting down by themselves doing that, but this has been a family thing. Oh, completely, completely. And, you know, the excitement as well, because I laugh now and I'm so grateful to ever be introduced to this because pretty much on a weekly basis, you know, as homeschoolers, we're all signed up to different blogs and you get things in your inbox and it's, oh, how to get through the math blahs and what to do when your child says, I don't want to do math or I hate math. And it's like, we don't have that. <laughs> yeah, it never happens. That doesn't happen in our house either. <laughs> no, never, 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 never. And, you know, it's quite the opposite. They're not begging to do math necessarily but if I say okay then you know let's get the blocks out it's like oh what are we doing today you know they, they're coming and enthusiastically not having to be dragged and the excitement is genuine when they're making these connections or they spot something some pattern that they're noticing and and it's really exciting for all of us because even with the basic processes, I'm noticing things and I knew it on an intellectual level, but then to actually see it and really understand it, like really understand it in your bones, like some of the things about basic addition, you know, even it's like, wow, that's what's happening. Yeah. I, I knew it, but never really knew it you know that right. fact, just that experience of it and seeing it and really understanding what you're seeing um i th there was a i don't remember his name and i'm gonna just but this is in the story is in the 
uh, module one of a hands-on learning where there was, Gutenio had sent a teacher to a first like, grade classroom to observe a, a lesson with the Cuisin Air Rods. Mm -hmm. And so he's sitting there and he says, so, so, so for the first time in his life, well, this is a teacher, just like you, teacher, who <laughs> says, so he's in a first grade classroom and he said, I understood the relationship between multiplication and division for the first time in his life. So this isn't me, just me, and it's not just you, but there are all these, which is what I find fascinating about doing math this way, is that all these pieces start to come together. All mm -hmm. these little things, and it makes it hard. Of course you don't understand. I'm thinking um, when we did chapter three, we were 18 months there in chapter three. Yeah. And um, I think the reason we stayed so long is because I was getting so much out of it is that I was learning math over again. And then all of a sudden, just like you, I started making these connections and I could see how all of this stuff suddenly was related. Mm. Like how did fractions and all of a sudden one day I'm doing, we're doing staircases and I'm like, oh, that's logarithms. Oh my gosh, that's what that is. That's what we're doing. You know, and I didn't know that before. I didn't know. I, I never understood you did your blog post. <laughs> right? I was so excited over that revelation. Like I, for the first time in my life, I understand logarithms because we are playing with staircases in kindergarten, first grade, for first grade. And we can start playing with logarithms now in first grade, but we were by accident. I mean, I didn't even know that's what we were doing. We were doing it by accident. And yeah. then suddenly you get somewhere else. And that's why I think that's also why, why it looks like it's taking a long time. How much time later you cut out and understanding and having to repeat stuff because you really thoroughly understand it here. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing that like my youngest, uh, he's just turned nine and there's auditory processing memory issues. And so it, you know, I, I always knew that memory was not a strong point because he forgets everyday words, you know. So the traditional route of maths where there's a lot of just rote memorization, I would have been doing him a huge disservice. And it's only now that kind of we know exactly what's going on with him. And through using the blocks, just the way he talks about numbers, he's really understanding the relationships. Sometimes, you know, like when we do the classes together, he doesn't remember the color names. He, he struggles a little bit with that. So we do do the number names more because that's easier for him. But the relationships he understands and he's talking about way bigger numbers because in the first few chapters, you're not working with big numbers at all. But somehow just because of the way everything's laid out and how you go through so thoroughly those basic numbers, it just enables them to make these huge leaps to these bigger numbers that if I was just trying to teach that from worksheets and whatnot I think I would have felt like I was banging my head against a brick wall and it's without effort I feel you know because it's a joy to play with the blocks that you know he's he's got this solid understanding and and we're not relying on memory he understands it and so that is a huge blessing for me. <laughs> yeah, Gutenio says memory in humans is weak. And yeah. that, we, that is the last thing that we should be using to teach with. Mm -hmm. they, come with other, they come with other functions, abilities, other ways to learn, you know, like truth, like mm -hmm. order. Like mm -hmm. there's other things that, that, that kids have that they come to, the, that they've, they've managed. I mean, so your son has trouble with memory and yet he manages to speak, which is infinitely more difficult than, than math. Mm -hmm. I mean, learning to speak a language is way harder than math. The, the rules of English are not the same. So he clearly can abstract, right? There's all these things that he has the ability to do. 
And so if we rely on memory to teach him math, that really is going to kick him out of that whole field because yeah. he's not going to be able to get it done. Yeah. 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 But the, but the truth of how numbers work is there in the rods and he sees that part. Yeah. And so well, he may not remember a name. He may not remember the arbitrary information, but he does understand the necessary information. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, it, you know, every day he'll say something that is related to numbers that, you know, I haven't necessarily taught, but just that he's gleaned from working with the rods and it just blows me away. Uh, you know, just the power that Gatenio just understood. And luckily for us, was able to put it down on paper so that we could replicate it. Yeah, it's really exciting. And I, you know, I always long to be excited about maths. And, you know, for me, this is, this is it. This is completely it. You know, I, and it's not easy. I do go through the textbooks and play a little on my own with the rods and kind of struggle. And, you know, sometimes Friday night, I'm dying for my husband to get home and it's nine, 10 o'clock. He's just walked in after being away for the week. And it's like, right, you have to sit down with me with the rods. I like, why, why, why is this happening? Like what's going on? <laughs> and, you know, and I, I just feel that it, it's amazing that that's the power with the rods, you know, that it can harness that enthusiasm, that it, you're not flogging a dead horse, you know, with <laughs> it. <It's, laughs> it. It really brings it alive. And it, it is, it's so exciting to do it. I love it. <laughs> and, and it's not just the rods. It is the um, presenting, I mean, I think the pattern of presenting the challenge and then doing the noticing and wondering so that you are using your own ability to figure out what's happening. Um, yeah. And the noticing, um, which, you're, which you're already doing, but I wanna just make a note to other parents that while you're, if you thoroughly notice and wonder, if you spend that time on, if you take some time, we don't always do it every single lesson, but we spend a lot of time noticing and wondering because um, you just can't help it. I mean, you can't help it because the stuff is there. Like, oh, I, I, this is this is reminds me of this. I saw this here. This is the same thing as this over here. Um, and so you you can't help but make those connections and and then wonder about how else it fits in with everything else. You know, mm -hmm. your husband comes home and you're saying, show me how and why this works. That's that's that wonder part. Why is this? And you don't have the patience to wait and figure it out. But most, most mathematicians, when they sit down, um, that's what drives them is that wonder thing. I mean, that's the thing that's like, how does all of this fit? Mm -hmm. You know, here's this thing and what's going on with the math? You know, and that, and not having to have the right, they don't have all the answers either. They have to go looking and they have to rack their ba brains and try and figure it out. Uh, but one of the things I noticed, and I think you mentioned it, is that um, the more we notice and wonder, the, we make the connections ourselves. And I, you can always trust Gitanyo to get you where you need to go. But if you do the notice and wonder part, I noticed I noticed that we often skip ahead two to three books and cover material, you know, two to three books further than where we currently are, just because we're like noticing and wondering. And when we get to that part, like, oh, that's old hat. We can just, you know, we can do these for fun. But we already did that back here because we played, noticed, and wondered. We changed the scenario. We renamed some rods. We combined some structures. And we already covered this a long time ago. Mm. Um, so like your son, you know, so, so like Ben and Alex and recognizing, oh, that we're making these huge leaps without you ever having to teach it because they can figure it out on their own. They don't yeah. need to be spoon fed. And I've noticed as well that when we're, you know, doing some science or something, you know, in English, they're like, oh, I'm noticing this happening, you know, and it's amazing just how much more observant they are 
and looking for connections in anything. And, uh, you know, and, and that didn't used to happen before as much, you know, and certainly, or maybe it's the language because we do use, you know, well, what do you notice? What are you wondering about? You know, we've actually started using that language. And so I, you know, maybe it's just me noticing that they're using that language now, but in all different circumstances and scenarios, which always makes me chuckle a little. <laughs> so I was actually going to ask you that question that's on my list. Like, how have you noticed that this has spilled over to other areas of life? Because in our house, it has. The right. notice and wonder and the paying attention, it has spilled over everywhere, not yeah. just with um, math. Yeah. And so we use it as a tool to learn almost every subject now. The paying, att attending, I would say, at paying attention to, mm -hmm. making observations, and then wondering what's happening. Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And, and I think it just, it focuses me more too, to make sure that there's time for that. You know, whereas sometimes, you know, just with the pressures of uh, homeschooling and you're always feeling like you're getting left behind or something, you know, and, well, I just have to read this. Let's just do it, you know. And But just realizing that the relationships and connections, that's a hugely important part of learning and not just, you know, spoon feeding information. You know, well, what does this information mean? Where does it fit in the bigger picture? Well, why does this happen? What, you know, and so I'm also more aware to, you know, follow their noticings and wonderings because I've seen just how valuable it is in the maths. So if you're, um, I'm going to say, so you guys are spending a lot of time noticing and wondering is like part of your method for teaching math and everybody coming understand this. So do you, how do you think this has affected your kids or do you think it has at all on their ability to, to when they're presented with problems that have nothing to do with math, but to make assessments and solve problems? Like, do you notice their confidence as problem solvers has gotten better? It's hard to say with Benjamin because he's never really seen he, his initial reaction to anything is like, oh, this is so hard and there's a bit of drama. And then like five minutes later, he's like, hmm, actually, you know, <laughs> he's figuring it out. So I'm, I'm used to that pattern. Um, and, you know, we've had a laugh about the drama you know can we can we just skip that bit first <laughs> just get down to it um but alex definitely i i notice more um and but i think it's also like a a general confidence related thing too because you know, when their noticing and wonderings have been taken seriously and are actively encouraged and, you know, can form the basis of discussion and further noticing and wondering, I, I definitely feel like, you know, they're, they're more willing to come forward and... And kind of follow that same route, you know. Like Alex, he'll, he, I, I think he perseveres a lot more because he'll sit and just start talking about things and wondering and noticing. Whereas before he was much more likely to kind of sit back and wait for you to step in and help. Whereas, you know, now it, it, it it's kind of made a framework for discussion almost. So yeah, he still may need that little bit of discussion, but it's based on what he's noticing and wondering about a variety of things. You know, he, he seems much more 
willing to approach a problem. So, um, because you brought this up, their willingness to approach a problem and that that you take their noticing and wondering seriously, Mm. that you do, and it changes a kid, it changes them. They have ideas that people take seriously about math that they have, and they have a lot of them. Yes. Lots of ideas about math. (laughs) And, um, (laughs) um, what was I going to say? See, memory in humans is weak. It's gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just gone. <laughs> um, oh, the confidence building. Um, so the question, so do you think, like what kind of advantages because I do think there is one. And I just want to know what you think. The advantages of not knowing math going in. So not having preconceived notions about where this stuff is going. Like, do you, th- how do you see that has played that, like what, you, what most parents come and see as a deficit? Um, mm-hmm. And I don't see it that way necessarily. I think it helps. You can get through things faster because you know where to lead your kids. You know what questions to ask. But you have no idea even what questions to ask. You have n- you're going in and it's blind. I don't know because I don't understand this either. Let's just figure it out. <laughs> So how how do you think that has helped you as a homeschooling mom with just two kids sitting down at the table? They're not intimidated, number one, because they know that I'm not going to be sat there, you know, kind of, well, I know what the answer is, you know, come on, because I probably don't know what the answer is. <laughs> And so, yeah, I mean, we have some real lively, like, how did you get that? What do you mean? Is that show me, you know, and, and it's, and it's a real back and forth. And so, you know, one thing I, I always feel sometimes is that, you know, because we're not part of a bigger group who's doing this. So where do they get those times to interact with somebody else who's genuinely exploring the idea with them? Um, you know, as a peer, they, you know, they don't have that necessarily because I don't do it with them both together because there's, there's a few things I can, like the fish activity I can do with them together. But on the whole, I do do them separately just because Benjamin is so much faster than Alex. And so I'm kind of their workmate separately. And um, yeah, so we have very lively discussions because we really don't know what's going to happen. And the kids feel very free, you know, to say to me, well, you know, just like they would to appear, well, why, why do you say that? What are you seeing? Like, where is that, you know, and, and real genuine questioning without any hesitation, without kind of, you know, looking like, well, is this right? Because sometimes, you know, if the teacher does kind of know everything, then the child's just wanting to know, well, is this the right answer? And looking at you to reinforce that, yes, this is the right answer or mm -mm, try again kind of thing. You know, I, I feel there's a much more genuine discussion going on and sharing because it is genuine. Mm hmm. You know, and like I say, you know, the aha moments, very, very genuine from both sides. And, you know, the noticing and wondering, very genuine. And, yeah, we really don't know what we're going to see. So we really do kind of both get very, very involved in it. I'm not kind of sat back waiting for Benjamin coming up with things or Alex coming up with things and kind of like, "Mm mm-hmm, well, keep coming. It is much more sharing, much more give and take, I think, than if I already knew. Because it's hard to fake it. You know, fake that you don't know. 
it, it, it is hard to fake it. And it is from my side, this is one of the things that I'm always have to struggle because I did spend a lot of time playing with the rods, even late at night. You know, <laughs> I was like hiding in my room. Well, I often wondered, were you ever sleeping? <laughs> no, not much. <laughs> And reading stuff like, no way, well, you know, it's midnight and here I am, back away, these are my rods, you know, I was kind of doing that stuff. So, so it's hard for me sometimes because I'm waiting and I'm leading and I have to watch myself. I'm leading in directions that they're not going in. He's not going in that direction. And so because I know, one, the next blog post I need to do and what's next in the book right? Like I have to be careful because I want to lead him into a, a fake conversation so that I can get to this next thing yeah. that I'm supposed to do. And so for me, it's always a struggle to, um, to not do that. And when I'm trying to get him somewhere and he's not going there to, to hide my, cause you've never done this. And I'm sure I am the only mom who does it. <sighs> you know, that <laughs> sigh <laughs> of disappointment and they hear you and it shuts you down. I mean, it really does. And I know from just being at the BBL and being in that position of the kid, right? That you're that kid and there's, there's Dr. Powell over your shoulder, right? And he doesn't say a word, but he's standing there and there's all of this pressure to perform. And I can't remember the names of the colors of the rods, right? <laughs> right? Let alone fraction names. I'm struggling with red and blue, right? <laughs> yeah. In that position, we're constantly putting our kids in. We mm. constantly do this to our kids. And we don't appreciate the kind of pressure that it's under. And I really am convinced that, that if you go at it the way you have done it, that it is a blessing to you to not know, mm. to really not know. Because there's a kind of amount of knowing, I think, that I had. There was, I knew enough to make me dangerous, but not helpful. But, yeah. You know, right? Because I got all the way through, like, I lost it after Algebra 2. Made it through Algebra 1, Geometry, Algebra 2. And then I was in over my head. Like, that's the, I'd risen to my level of incompetence. And it was at the end of Algebra 2. I couldn't, there was enough I didn't understand that I couldn't go any further. And, uh, but I knew enough to get you, I could get you through Saxon and textbooks. Hmm. It's not enough to understand, not enough to help you with what you didn't understand, but enough to get you so that I can, I can make your kids score post high school on a standardized test. Now they might cry, Okay, but I can get that done. They won't know anything, won't understand any of it, but I can do it. And that is a dangerous place for a parent to be. Mm. And it is a, and it puts you kind of, I think, in an adversarial relationship with your child. Whereas, um, and I feel like I'm always aware of that, that, that like I do that to my kids. I put them in an adversarial relationship with me when we sit down. Whereas if I didn't know anything at all, I could actually genuinely sit down and play. Yeah, yeah. And we do, we have fun. Like, it's amazing. I, I, I'm just blown away just how much I don't know. <laughs> and, but in the way that it's presented, because I do use the textbook as a spine for sure. And then, you know, um, lacy sheets. I love the um, number study and the structure studies. And I, I love doing those. And even though some of them, I'm not sure how to do them. You know, I'm not quite sure what it's asking. But I, that's good. You know, I, I, I'm not scared by it anymore. And I know that... I'll ask somebody and they'll just kind of explain it and probably you. <laughs> and it'll be like, yeah, you know, but I, I, I feel that this enthusiasm for it is, is, is such a blessing, you know, because I, I dread to think what this could have looked like if it was with a traditional textbook. 
I think the children would have been in school because it would have been them or me at that point, I think, you know, and they would have hated maths. I'm absolutely sure of it because of my own, like, oh, you got to learn it. You know, I, it would have been horrendous. <laughs> That's what I did. It doesn't work so well. Just letting you know. Yeah. In, case, in case you wanted to know. Yeah, it doesn't go so well. <laughs> Yeah. So how do you think, um, how do you think this has changed you as a, like doing it has changed you as a parent? Or do you think it has? Mm, I think, um, I think it's like an, a, another piece to it because because of how I was in, in maths and kind of how I then was, well, I don't want this very traditional way. I, I, I think that's, it, it's kind of very complimentary then and, and pushed me further to kind of really analyze, well, what is it then that we're doing in the other subjects? Um, what what really is important then in life too you know like looking at the bigger questions like is it all about just cramming things in and and rushing through things and you, you know I, I I feel like relationships in anything is has become more important you know that like relationships is 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 the crux of anything in life basically and you know i i keep coming back to that many many times now you know with our relationship with the environment our relationship with each other our relationship with community our you know relationship with work with money with you know that that it's really made me think about just that term relationship and what does that mean really? And, and, and not so much about content, you know, and rushing through things. We have to understand our relationship in the world. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty big, but <laughs> this um, is what keeps me awake at night, like thinking like this. One of the things that we have um, that's changed for us in, in our house is, is specifically how I discipline has changed. Oh, interesting. And we um, spend a lot more time instead of me um, getting angry, unless there's direct defiance, you know, that happens. I'm sure I'm the only child for a parent who has a child who <laughs> looks at you and defies you while they're staring at you in the face, right? It's only at my house that happens. Um, <laughs> So, so other than that, or these, these rudeness and all of these behaviors that we have, other than direct defiance, um, we spend a lot more time observing the situation, mm. noticing and wondering what was going on, mm. and then paying attention to how we could have changed that, what would have been different, what we could, you know, like wondering, noticing our own, be taking a step back without judgment. You know, this has helped me not judge my own child. You know what I mean? And so to step back and then observe him without making judgments and having him step back from his own behavior without making judgments and noticing and wondering about it, writing this stuff down. I mean, we do that too. We notice and wonder about our own behavior and what's going on. What am I looking for? Why am I, am I jealous? Am I angry? Am I, you know, what's going on? And then, you know, wondering, cause that's part of the, cause they don't know. Yeah. They don't know until we actually take time to step back and think about it. And the thing that I've noticed, noticed this in him is that he pays more attention to his own behavior. Now he's more aware of what it is that he's doing. So this is like, that's like the big one for me that's changed is just how I discipline in the house. It's changed everything for me um, for how we teach everything. Same thing. The same thing you noticed that we, that um, the important thing for me is that he's able to go into a situation 
and have the confidence that he can observe his surroundings, mm -hmm. notice and wonder and solve a problem. He can walk into the backyard and notice that there are weeds growing around and that we should pick them. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There's like that there is, there, there is a task in front of you and you can notice and wonder enough and pay attention enough that you can actually accomplish the task and do a good job without me coming to give you approval, that you have the confidence to do this. You don't have to keep looking at me and saying, is it okay? Did I do a good job? You can know whether you did a good job or not. You have enough information that you know that without my help. And yeah. I think that has changed everything for how I, I raise my kid and how, and every subject that we're, if, if, if I have to, if I have a no, if I have to teach a subject that requires me to give feedback for him to know whether he's done a good job or not, I don't want to use that. I want to use something right. where he has the skills or we're developing the skills so that he knows on his own mm. whether this is right or this is wrong. Mm. Anyway, that's my thought on it. Was that, but because Gitanio is so, I mean, he was just a great thinker, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, a great observer, obviously. Um, he, spent, he spent years thinking about it on purpose. Yeah, yeah. And so is this one of the things as well then that come from him that if, if you do start to use notice and wonder that he kind of just knew that it would have this ripple effect into all other areas. Um, I think his whole, because he, I mean, he, okay. So he says that only awareness is educable in human beings. You can't teach anybody anything unless they're aware of it. Yes. So I, mm -hmm. so if that's true, I'm, and my son is unaware of his behavior. Let's just say he's unaware of both, both his behavior, what leads up to the current behavior, and the possible consequences of that behavior. If we have, if we have a passing notice, if it only shows up when, I'm re when mom screams at me, what I notice right now is not how I got here. What I notice is that my mom is going to rip my face off and I'm gonna do anything I can to stop her from ripping my face off. So I'm probably going to lie. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, and I noticed that I was putting my child in a situation where he was forced to lie, mm -hmm. you know, like he doesn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. So if he, if, if, if we can only teach him based on awareness so that we get to a point eventually, if we are aware, if we've noticed, we've wondered that at this point, we all agree it's disobedience, right? Mm -hmm. It's just defiance. And then, and then we have a choice to make. Do you want to be defiant? And then the consequences of defiance and what happens if there is defiance, if, if that's what you want to choose, then, then you can make a conscious choice about it. Mm. So, but he talks about awareness and just everything that he does, that, that whole power of intentionally directing your attention and becoming aware. So how much time it saves you learning an instrument or quitting smoking or all of that stuff. You mean how many, how many we just go through our lives on autopilot, not thinking about what we're doing or why we're doing it. You know, we, we're homeschoolers. So we go to the homeschool fair, the homes, you know what I mean? And you buy the curriculum because that's what everybody does. And you don't even think about what you're doing or why you're doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't, we don't, you know, we don't write our relationship to the environment. Why are we doing this? Why, mm -hmm. why do we do the habits, the things and let's, if we're going to do them, let's do them on purpose. Yes. Yes. Instead of accidentally. So yeah. it, that's why I said, yes. Just like you it's changed everything for us mm -hmm. to not do things. To, to, do the, to do it purposely. Yes, right? that's the difference, yes. Yeah, with real intention, because that's really what you want to do. Right, because, you know, we've, we, we, and I used to talk to him about this. Like, he would say, well, it was an accident. Okay, I get, I get you didn't mean to have all the consequences of this. Okay, like, I have lived my life not wanting the consequences of what I got, right? Totally get that. <laughs> okay, but what I didn't do was intentionally do the thing I ought to do. Mm. You know, I mean, of course you didn't mean to do that. I'll give that to you. Nobody wakes up and says, I want to rip, have my mom rip my face off today. Nobody says that. 
Okay, but what you didn't do is what you should have done or what would have made your life easier or what would have brought a blessing to you or to other people. But, but I try, like, I mean, this is really a selfish thing. You're in trouble now. You know, this isn't going, your life isn't going well. Yeah. What, what is the thing? <laughs> What is the thing here that would have made your life go well? Like, like how could have this gone differently? Mm -hmm. But it's, but it's that way about everything when you're spending money. I mean, like when you get done, you didn't really mean to be $10,000 in debt, yeah. you know, that nobody sets out and says, Hey, okay. Yeah. There are some people who probably do, but most people don't go, Hey, I think I'd like to be a hundred thousand dollars in debt. That sounds like a good plan and go bankrupt and lose everything. Mm -hmm. We did it without intention without yeah. attending to. So there's these fleeting noticings, but we didn't actually attend to what we noticed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like how you teach in traditional math, how I learned is there's these like fleeting, like I kind of knew that, you know, I mean, I kind of was aware that that's like, you know, I heard about that. You know, I kind of understood fractions. You know, my big one was, I've had a lot of them, but my big one was, um, powers of 10, right? Mm -hmm. Each time you move a decimal point, it's a power of 10. Like, okay, because right, because you multiply and divide by 10 and that's how you do that. And of course, it's a power of 10. Like, of course, that's what that is. You know, of course I knew that, but I didn't know that. Like one day I was like, oh, this is like powers of 10. Well, of course I knew it, but like, obviously I didn't know it. Because yeah. one day I realized like in a real way that this is what was happening. So there was this fleeting thing, you know, but because we never sat down and I never intend, like there were these exercises that I mindlessly repeated <laughs> without ever understanding what was going on. I could do all of that and still not know. It's funny you say about the powers of 10. I think it was Friday or Saturday. Um, my husband's pushing Benjamin to learn uh, the relationship with fractions and percentages. And uh, <laughs> he said something about, well, you're just moving your decimal point. And I'm like, well, you're adding zeros. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was only like, it literally about 20 minutes. And I'm like, you are, you're moving the decimal point. <laughs> So it's so funny you say that. <laughs> but that was like, I'm telling you, that was like three years ago, maybe? Like three years, I'm a grown adult. This is like second grade stuff here, right? And I just figured that out for like really real, for like really real, like it really, really hit me, right? Because I hadn't been given enough time to really be aware of it. I hadn't given enough time to intentionally notice what was happening. And I think that is making room for our kids to think. Mm. And it doesn't require that I know how to do it. It requires that I give them enough space to learn how to do it. And they will probably teach me. Mm. Mm. For sure. For sure. Yeah. It, it's us getting out of the way, isn't it? To enable them to learn. <laughs> well, uh, right. See, that's the subordination of teaching to learning. Yeah. You get out of the way and you leave space for yeah. your kids to learn. And that's easier, I think. I mean, I don't know because see, I'm on this side, but I keep, I just like have been envious of you for a while now because <laughs> like, because you don't know and it really is all new. Yeah. Right. It is all new. And so it's a first time, but you can only have that, you know, if you have six kids and it can only be new the first time. Yes. So, um, so you, you lose that if you, you know, if you have six kids, you lose that because by the time the last one comes, you know, now. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there isn't that whole, cause you still are, you like, you're back here. We're back here doing this whole because once you know and you can see it, your desire, you know, I, I, and I've had moms. I just want to, how do I teach him? How do I explain this to him? Like, don't stop yeah. the, stop the explaining, give them time and space to think for themselves. Yeah. And I mean, you know, that for me going through school, we were just told this is what it is. This is how it works. And 
didn't do me any good. And I know like people my age who I, you know, who were, who were in my math class too, you know, even now I see Facebook comments and, and it was only a few weeks ago. One of them said, yeah, but you've got to remember, you know, I went to this school and I was in this maths class and what do you expect? You know, cause it was a whole bunch of us left with no clue. Yeah, I know. I, I think it's not your math class. I think it was math classes all over the place. Yeah. Just, just yeah. this was, this is just how it was taught the road. And it's not necessarily bad. I mean, obviously you, you have to know, um, you know, you don't have to, but um, if you're going to do math, it is, it is beneficial to have some basic facts memorized, right? Like it's really helpful to know your multiplication facts. It's really helpful to know off the top of your head, addition facts. Mm -hmm. um, that stuff is really helpful for seeing patterns, you know, so yeah. to pay attention to what's going on is to have those things down, but to approach all of it that way was not, well, it didn't help me. Mm. Um, you know, mm. you, so you weren't the only one. There's a whole, all kinds of people that have, I mean, you think about it though. I mean, nobody ever says, you hear people say what? You say, oh, I never learn to play the piano. I can't, I'm not musically inclined. And people will say, oh, I just don't do math. Nobody ever says, oh, I've just not, a, I just never learned to read. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah. Like, what would we, I mean, if we said that we would say something is horribly wrong. Yeah. Just like, what do you mean you never learned to read? Yeah. Like, don't you think you should fix that? And we think nothing of people saying, horrified. oh, yeah. What? We'd be horrified. If someone said, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just. I'm just was just never a reading type of person. Blind or, yeah, <laughs> yeah you, you just wouldn't believe it. So what do you think when people say to you now, that when they say, oh, I'm not a maths person? I just laugh and say, yeah, neither am I, but I'm loving it, you know, now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it just, you know, and it's all about the opportunity. It's just all about that opportunity to see it. And also another thing, you know, that like we've been doing the multiplication um, because I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around why are we doing it in terms of the the products, you know, the relationship of the products. You know how you go like 12, 24, 48 when you're studying multiplication in book two. And I, I love it because it's all about the doubling and halving and never looked at multiplication in that way. Never had any idea to even think about it in that way. And it, it just blows my mind that wow yeah like it, it, it makes sense like why why was this never a part of you know just playing with maths where was they playing with maths there just wasn't you know it, it was all about well here's the page and this is what we're doing and and the, yeah I, I it just never ceases to amaze me just how fun it can be. <laughs> the, the doubling and having thing, that gets me excited. I love doubling, having, and tripling. Because you can take, once you can double and have, like, so I was doing the, um, she said, oh, you have to learn your multiplication facts. Well, there's actually only three that have to be memorized. There's That's three right. <laughs> multiplication facts that have to be memorized, right? Three times seven is one. Um, three times three times three, three times seven, and there's another one, and I can't remember which one it is. No, there's the only there's only three that have to be memorized. Everybody knows ones. Ones can be doubled to twos, and twos mm -hmm. can be doubled to fours. Fours can double to eights. Okay, so those are done. Tens are easy. Yeah. Right? Nine, there's a pattern, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. There's this pattern with nine that's super super easy to deal with, right? So that one doesn't have to be memorized. That's like you can do those in a pattern. Um, half of five, half of 10 is five. So those can be halved. Yeah. Tens can be halved, but you can do your fives and double those. But the fives are super easy because there's this, like the five, zero, five, zero pattern. So that's pretty easy. 
Okay, so now you're left with the set of threes and sevens. That's it, but almost all the sevens can be halved or doubled from some other number, yeah. right? Because you've got the, you've got, the, you know, you've got, um, you can't do three times seven, but you can do one times seven and two times seven. So that's really easy. Uh, four times seven is done because that's double two times seven. Yeah. Right? So there's like almost eight times seven is done. Nine times seven is done. Ten times seven is done. Five times seven is done. It's just three. Three times three, and that's it. There's like not much left. So how easy? That's all of your multiplication facts. But I'd never heard of it. I I knew the nines. I knew the trick with the nines, but the doubling and halving never occurred to me. Ne it so, was been brought to my attention, and my attention wasn't there to bring it to my own attention. And yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> And if you look like later, later, like taking huge multiplication problems, multiplications of like three numbers or four numbers where you can have one and double the other. Like, so you look at like what's going on where you're looking at um, playing around with like three times certain things and six times certain things and how you can have and double those to make difficult problems really easy. Mm -hmm. Like, and just like, if we're just doing that, just how much math you learn by taking a hard problem and finding a new way to solve it instead of just going through the algorithm, because that's what we do, but yeah. to, you know, but to play with it, to notice and wonder and find easier ways to solve. You learn more math doing one problem and finding yeah. 10 easy, 10 easy ways to solve it than you would by, by having to do 30 problems to master an algorithm, particularly the subtraction one with borrowing is mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. irritates me. <laughs> That's about one of the few things I can actually do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I hate that. I hate that algorithm. I hate I mean, kids hate that algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. Borrowing and regrouping. Oh my goodness. It's like the most cumbersome mistake prone algorithm we've got. We we particularly enjoy your um, all nine rest. No, what is it? All from nine last from, from nine last from ten. Yeah, yeah. We, we particularly like that. <laughs> okay, so if you were going to give, because we're running out of time, so I wanted to do this for an hour. So if you're going to give a piece of advice to a mom who's in the same position you were, and you could just give her a couple of bits of advice, what would you say? I would say what worked for me anyway was literally either photocopy one of your activities or look on Liz's blogs and get that concrete idea of, you know, if you're wanting to sit down and do an actual activity and you've done lots of free play and, you know, just played around like that and you're like, okay, I kind of want to do something a little bit more formal I would say just copy what somebody else has done <laughs> <laughs> because it just takes the pressure off you you know and to just have that little bit of an idea of okay well I know where this one's going just you know it, it's just wetting your toe because for me once I'd done that over and over from your blog post and from Lacey and and doing the classes with you and seeing the activities from the conference just having that framework to work within you you gain your own confidence in oh okay I I can notice some things and oh my my child's responding and this is working and yeah so it just for your own confidence as a crutch copy don't make it hard on yourself when when other people have done it that that's that would be my biggest biggest piece of advice because it gets you started that is real that is not what i thought you would say and that is excellent advice oh completely i'm an absolute plagiarist i uh... <laughs>